Well, welcome everybody to the Menlo Midweek Podcast. My name is Mark, and we have Jeremy here with us today. Hi. Jeremy's back. He was helping volunteer with us um, to record this podcast. And Jeremy, how has summer been down in Saratoga campus? Oh, summer's been great in Saratoga. Last week we had a pickleball that was uh, in between. What do you mean you had a pickleball? Oh, in between and after services, one of the small groups set up pickleball for people to play out in the uh, parking lot. And I heard it got real competitive and real fun. Did you play? No, I didn't. I was in small group, unfortunately. Ah, But a lot of people did have fun. Awesome. Well, speaking of sports, Mm -hmm. um, we are going to be hosting an online basketball event. The basketball is not online. We actually have rented out Burgess Park. Um, gymnasium here in Menlo Park from 7 to 9 p.m. on the last Saturday of the month. I think it's the 28th or so. And so we'd love to invite you, if you've been a longtime listener and maybe haven't joined us in person in a while or ever, come and hang out. Play some basketball with us. Bring some friends. It's an open invite. You can find more information online, and there'll also be a post on our socials about it for time and date in case you forget. But love for you to RSVP so we can let you know about um, where to park and all of that. Uh, and just have a great summer, everyone. We have a lot of things going on here. A reminder for the backpack drive. Um, Saratoga has been doing some cool things with that as well. Yes, yes. So you have the 14th, which is this weekend, yep. and the 21st, which is next weekend, to pick up the slips for the backpack drive yep. and uh, donate the supplies. Yeah, and it's one of the most amazing things that we do here, in my opinion, because I've seen it in action where the kids at the schools get to go in and pick out their backpack and see it full of supplies and it's like Christmas. It's been so fun. So so thank you to all of those that have contributed so far for that. Uh, Make sure you pick up a slip this weekend in person or if you are not in the area, we can send you one. You can text our team at 650-600-0402. And now let's go ahead and jump into our podcast today with Aisha and Scott. Welcome everybody to the Menlo Midweek Podcast. My name is Mark and we have two guests with us today. We have Aisha with us, making her return to the podcast. That's right. And we have the Reverend Dr. Scott Palmbush. I'm glad to be here. This is fun. Always fun. It is always fun, Scott. Um, And it's just been up. Uh, we were talking about this earlier today with Aisha. It's just like a hot summer these oh, last man. couple of weeks. Hot, yeah. hot summer, hot and it's today. a very hot day. I know. Yeah. So, what have you guys been doing with your families to cool down? How's summer been so far? And let's just get caught up on what's going on in your family's lives. Yeah. You want to kick it off? All right. Sure. Well, uh, it's it's hot is. Uh, tricky for us because we don't have air conditioning so i have the portable air conditioner that i set up in the living room and then i have fans that you know (laughs) i have a whole system (laughs) that i set up and take down every night and so it's kind of a fun project but uh we just kind of huddle in the in the you know the dining room there and Uh but uh yeah the you know it's fun to go to the pool um some folks that have a pool that we can use once in a while um but other than that yeah it's mostly just just hanging out yeah. um is it a full house and, for you for the summer uh yeah all my kids are home i have Ooh. four kids they're all with us and okay. that is fun um and sometimes a little you know we get a little yeah a little too much togetherness <laughs> well, i don't know that's hard to yeah. be you know hard to imagine but uh so but uh last week my uh, one of my kids was in Taiwan with his friend, so he was away. Okay. And so people are kind of coming and going, yeah. too, as as you will. But, yeah, it's been a fun summer with the kids. Sounds yeah. like it. It's mm-hmm. always fun having them home. Very fun. Awesome. Yeah. How about for you, Aisha? Yeah. Our summer kicked off early June. Mm-hmm. Uh, I had a week in New York for work. Okay. And then my husband, myself, and my three sons, we flew out to Amsterdam for a very good friend's wedding. Yeah. And then we spent the next three and a half weeks traveling throughout Europe. Amazing. By train. Wow. By train? So By jealous. train. Yeah. yeah. So we did Amsterdam, Vienna, Budapest, Prague, and Berlin. Oh, and all by train. Awesome. Yeah, it was really, really nice. And then myself and my oldest son, who's 14, yep. flew back yep. last week. And my husband and my two younger ones yep. went to Nigeria, where we're from originally, okay. to go hang out with their grandparents. Yeah. And so now I'm just back at work, and my 14-year-old is playing video games and sleeping and eating. Yeah. Um, and the other guys are in Nigeria hanging out with family and yeah. eating as well. Um, and so it's been a pretty fun summer. Yeah. Fortunately, we have air conditioning in our home, mm. so... So, um, Lucky, I'm coming over. Yeah, you yeah. should. You should. <laughs> Fortunately, we yeah. do. Um, so yeah, but it's been a busy summer. Either traveling or now I'm back at work and yeah. I'm 
kind of all day at work. Cool. And when does the rest of your family get back? In a week and a half. Okay. So in a week for, and a half. So I'm for... enjoying yeah. a really yeah. calm, quiet, yourself. clean mm-hmm. house. It's not clean something house. I've been used to for mm-hmm. the 15 years of being a mom. <laughs> okay. So I'm enjoying it. Yeah, that's great. Our house is kind of clean most of the time, even though it's just Missy and I. We have one of those portable air conditioning units, but we have it in our bedroom. Ah, uh, good idea. So our house is now just a one bedroom. <laughs> it's, <laughs> a one bedroom it's a studio. Yeah. yeah, it's now a studio. Exactly. Uh, with a little kitchenette that we go in sometimes when it's really hot to make dinner. <laughs> but it's been good for the most part. We had a really fun 4th of July where we went over to Missy's grandma's house. She has a pool. So us and all of everyone else that we know that knows grandma was there <laughs> in the pool for 4th of July. It was just a fun time. But it's it just feels like summer is fun this year. Yeah. And just like there's things that are happening yeah. despite the heat. And loving the summer series as well. It's been diving into Romans yep. chapter eight, yep. mm-hmm. which has been described as one of the most impactful verses or chapters in all of the Bible, which has been really cool. So I asked Phil this the other day yeah. and wanted to ask you two the same. I think I asked Meg and Josh this on the podcast as well, as we're looking at this chapter as one of the greatest of all time chapters. Do you have a greatest of all time disciple? And so... Let's start with Scott. I want to put you in the hot seat, Scott. <laughs> wow. Well, you know, you hear more about some of the disciples than the others, so it's yeah. it's a little bit easier to, uh, you know, know about them. But um, I think, I don't know, I mean, lots of people are going to be drawn to Simon Peter, of course. Okay. Uh, he gets uh, a lot of airtime in the Bible. And <laughs> yeah. I think, you know, the reason I love him, a lot of people appreciate uh, Peter's because he's he's very uh, human in the sense of he's flawed and uh, yeah. uh, makes a lot of mistakes. I feel like I can relate to him as a disciple. I feel yep. like that's you mm-hmm. know that's kind of how I live and how I follow Jesus, mm-hmm. <laughs> make a lot of mistakes, and mm-hmm. I'm grateful for his uh, grace in in that. But uh, you know, John's another one. Uh, he uh, just his emphasis on love and uh, you know uh, loving and and. Mm how that is such a big part of who God is. So that also strikes a chord in me. But yeah, so those would be my my that. goat answer. Okay. There you go. I show that for you. So technically, this is probably not biblically accurate because I don't think she's it a can't disciple. can't be yourself. Oh, okay. <laughs> but mine would have to be Mary, Jesus's mom. Hey. And maybe I'm projecting because I'm a mother, yeah. but can you imagine that the... the a spirit comes to you and tells you yeah. that you are going to be carrying the Christ that the world has been waiting for mm. in your body, and you have to carry him for nine months, grow him, have him, and then raise him. Yeah. Right? Wow. Um, she was the most committed disciple, at least after God. Mm. She... She raised him. She looked after him. She had absolute faith in him, which is why at the wedding, yeah. she was like, he's fine. He knows yeah. what he's doing. He yeah. can do it. She <laughs> believed in him from yeah. day one until he died and rose wow. again. So I would say that she's my my goat of a disciple. Wow. That's a great answer. Yeah. You want to preach for us sometime? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm, that gets me so curious as to like, as Jesus was growing up, do you think she ever doubted that he was the son of God? Because like, we don't hear about a ton of miracles happening. We see him apprenticing as like a human, whether that's carpentry or stonework or whatever that was. So I wonder if there's any doubts that were like, was this like a real thing that happened? I mean, I don't know. I don't know if we'll ever get an answer, but that's- I don't think we're ever going to get an answer, at least not here on earth. No, that's (laughs) that's what my mind went to. But thank you for putting me in a space of wonder. I really appreciate that. (laughs) Um, Scott, let's dive in. So um, you were teaching on our fourth week of this summer series that we're in and all about inheritance and embracing our identity and that comes along with that. So why don't you give uh, the listeners a little bit of a recap on your message in case they missed it and then we'll dive in from there. Yeah, it's a great, uh, I mean, as we've said, Romans 8 is a wonderful mm-hmm. full chapter uh, and, and and really explores the Apostle Paul's kind of theology and heart and his understanding of uh, the power and majesty of God. So uh, I got this uh, passage, uh, 12 through 17, where um, we, we get this language of adoption and mm-hmm. inheritance, uh, and it's it's just a really comforting and really wonderful 
uh, part of the text. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it starts off, um, again, the kind of theme that Paul has about uh, there's the flesh and the spirit, yep. and uh, and we have... Uh, he says, uh, uses this word "afoletes," that means uh, obligation, um, this kind of indebtedness to say, uh, because we've been given this gift, um, we're called to then uh, live into it, live in uh, the reality and the mm-hmm. power. And Phil talked about power previously right. uh, that that we've been given, um, and um, if we if we do that, if we live in the the spirit that way, then we're honoring um, the gift that's been given to us, and yeah. so. There's a big call for that. And then uh, Paul talks about us uh, being uh, the children of God, Mm -hmm. that we are adopted Mm -hmm. uh, into the family Mm -hmm. as God's Mm -hmm. child. And I think um, that comes with an identity. I'm not just me. um, I am a child of God. And and, and if we really embrace that, that comes with a whole set of things, right, Uh, about being in a family. And I I was... uh, Phil's mentioned this book, N.T. Wright, The Heart of Romans, but uh, he really uh, kind of opens up this idea that as children of God, the inheritance that we have, um, we get to be part of the family in kind of every way. And that means um, not just with the, the the power that comes with that and the authority in a sense, but um, the obligation to live as uh, a beacon of God's love in the world and also to be part of the mission and work that God's doing in the world. Um, It's like you think of a family, like we get to be, you know, if you're a guest, you get to sit on the couch, right? And uh, we serve you. But if you're part of the family, um, you get a job. You got got some chores to do. You got things to do. And, and, uh, and I think um, that idea that we're, no, we're part of this mission. We're part of what this work that God's doing uh, is, is a really uh, powerful call to kind of the vocation. No matter what we do, right, our, our identity uh, puts us in that place where we are part of the work that God's doing. So I just, yeah. I love that heart of it. And, uh, and you know, um, also being part of this family means we don't escape uh, the challenge of it as well. Right. And we think about... Jesus, who showed us what this really looked like, mm-hmm. um, and in his suffering and in his his death, um, and there's a kind of death that we we experience as well to ourselves. Uh, we experience suffering in our own way in various ways, mm-hmm. um, and that's part of it too. But it it's all for the purpose that God intends, and so yeah. there's a, it's not meaningless in that sense. So that's kind of how Paul wraps up this section. Uh, but it's just it's rich in so many ways. Yeah. Yeah. I love to, in the start of your message, you talked about your last name being actually not your last name and how that was the inheritance that you <laughs> asked mm-hmm. your son, like, what have you inherited from yeah. me? So that, how did you figure out, like, that's what happened in your family history? And I think that's, that's just so funny. Well, it's, uh, yeah, it was just kind of well known in our family history because there were these uh, brothers in the Netherlands okay. um, and two of them came over and... Yeah. Uh, settled in Holland, Michigan, which is yeah. a very, you know, Dutch, obviously Holland, Michigan. <laughs> you don't have to go very far to figure out. <laughs> okay. So, uh, and yeah. it was, you know, it's kind of the lowlands by the, uh, right. by the water. It felt like home. <laughs> it was cold, you know, so okay. we'll, we'll just be here. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, those two brothers kind of, you know, like a lot of uh, immigrants, right, created a beachhead and kind of said, hey, bring over the rest. But the rest of the brothers that came over, uh, including my grandfather, my oh. great grandfather, um, yeah. you know, when they got to Ellis Island, uh, they, they all of a sudden were palm bush instead of palm boss. And so, Whoa. uh, it was just a, you know, just a clerical error, right? They were, they yeah. literally, they weren't using vibe boards. They just <laughs> wrote in a book. <laughs> so, um, but you know, they were like, we're going to go, we're in America. We're going to love it. it. We're, we're going to go with it. So, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, the fun part is, so then they went out to Holland, Michigan, and then um, eventually uh, kind of stayed there for a few uh, a few years, but then they were, you know, la- giving away land, right, in the, in the West, and so yeah. they went out to Montana, okay. which is where I grew up, yep, and yeah. Uh, so, yeah, a little family history there, but oh, wow. if, if, if you hear of a palm bush, somehow I'm related to that, so. <laughs> That's yeah. incredible. Fun. It sounds very Californian, though, doesn't it? It kind of does. Yeah. Yeah, I, I would have thought so. Yeah, <laughs> palm. <laughs> I know, right? And then a bush. Yeah. Um, Aisha, as, as you kind of spent some time in this passage, and there's themes of identity, themes of inheritance. What popped out for you? And I'm curious, as um, you are living out your identity um, in business and in the things that you're doing, how does that play a part in how you conduct yourself, what you think about as you lead yourself and your teams? Yeah. Yeah. 
Many things Mm -hmm. jumped out at me. I think this idea that we are heirs of the Father and Mm co-heirs with Christ is very empowering, right? It's like Mm -hmm. you wake up in the morning and you're like, oh, I'm just Aisha. But then something's like, yeah, but just Aisha is not it. Like you Mm. are the daughter of the great God that we serve. And that... With that comes so many blessings, with Mm. that comes so many challenges, Mm -hmm. Um, but the identity in Christ is is really something that I think as Christians we can't forget, and the world will help you forget it, Mm -hmm. because you get so bogged down in everyday life, the challenges, the difficulties, you forget that the Bible doesn't say that we won't have difficulties, but it does say that we will have his peace. In those difficult moments. Mm -hmm. And so for me, that identity, I just constantly have to remind myself who I am and whose I am. Mm -hmm. And that's very comforting to me Mm -hmm. in the most exciting moments Mm -hmm. and in the most difficult moments. And as an entrepreneur, I've really dug into this idea of being a faith-driven entrepreneur. And when I say that to people, they're like, what does that mean? Right, because I'm not selling Bibles. I don't work in the church. Right. Um, in fact, I sell beauty products. Right. Mm. So how do, how does that come to be? Mm. But I I tell people that you, when your faith is a part of you to the sort of the most germane part of your DNA, it's in everything you do. Mm. How you create content, how you hire mm-hmm. people, mm-hmm. how you train those people, how you empower those people, wow. how you deal in the marketplace, how you allow your brand to be represented. And mm-hmm. so one of the things that I love about this, these particular verses, uh, verse 12 through 17, is this idea that you you are constantly in spirit. Yeah. The spirit doesn't just come when you call it, and when, that's not the way it is when mm-hmm. you're a Christian and mm-hmm. when you are trying to be Christ-like. Mm-hmm. And so I'm constantly trying to remind myself to make sure that I'm constantly a representation Mm -hmm. of Christ. And so I may not be talking about the Holy Spirit all the time when I'm at work, but I would hope that anyone who interacts with me, um, interacts with my products or my company Mm -hmm. is like, this look, she, this is, this is like, you know, a a house built on the top of a hill. Mm -hmm. There's something different here. Mm -hmm. I see a light here. Mm -hmm. And then as you get to know me, you see where that light is coming from. Yeah. And so that's the way I think about representation for myself, for my business, yeah. and how I put being a faith-driven entrepreneur into practice. Yeah. I was just hanging out with uh, a longtime Menlo friend, and she was talking to me, too, about how her work is very strict on what she al- she's allowed to share with her faith and personally, uh, and how she was struggling with that, because she, like, she wants to be able to talk about her faith at work, but it, she kind of can't, and so we kind of came to the conclusion of something similar, that people will notice a difference in how she's treating people, and the energy, and the, the, um, the ways in which she's caring for her students, and stuff like that, and so... Um, she found encouragement in being able to live out her faith in the hopes that people will be able to see that and experience that because of that identity that's with her. Yeah. It's, it's pretty tricky. I, Mm -hmm. I, so social media is very, my social media personally and professionally Mm -hmm. are very different. Mm -hmm. Um, and so in my personal social media, I am very vocal about being Christian and I almost see that as my responsibility because I want people to know that you can be an entrepreneur in the world, Mm -hmm. but Mm -hmm. not be of the world. And so that's very important to me, but I don't do that in in my professional setting. Um, but people will, you know, people see the crossover. And I've yeah. had people say things like, oh, I was going to buy a lipstick from you, but when I saw you're all about Jesus, you know, mm-hmm. I'm not buying the mm-hmm. lipstick. And for me, that's, I love that because I'm, I have an opportunity to say to somebody, I love you anyway. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I love you anyway. That's and maybe enough. you will go think about it. Yeah. Maybe it will dig you deeper against mm-hmm. Christ. Mm-hmm. But I'm hoping that you will see me and say, that's interesting. Because yeah. you obviously were attracted initially. Mm-hmm. And you heard me talk about Jesus. And it, 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 it got you thinking. Yeah. And so I'm very vocal about it because I can. Because mm-hmm. I'm not in the position that your friend is mm-hmm. in. Mm-hmm. I can be an ambassador for mm-hmm. Christ mm-hmm. in the lay world. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I, I think that's a great example, too, of where um, there is some cost to this, right? Like if you're going right. to live, and I think that phrase being um, in but not of the world, is, is that's a really 
encap- way to encapsulate some of what Paul's talking here. Um, and by the spirit in me, I can, I can live into that identity. Yeah. But there's a cost to that because not everybody's going to like that. But the world will give you an identity. Mm-hmm. And we're always facing kind of, am I going to, which, you know, flesh or spirit? And, yeah. and am I going to listen to one or the other? And, um, and, you know, again, at the end to say, um, there's going to be some level of people that aren't going to like that. The world yeah. is going to um, resist that. So yeah. there, there is that piece, but um, that, that courage to say, I'm going to do my best to right. live uh, in that is great. And I, yeah. I think one, one of the misnomers or one of the things I think that, that I had to wrestle with a little bit in the yeah. passage was, yeah. uh, was this idea of if I'm living by the Spirit, does that mean I'm, I'm living perfectly? Like, what does it mean oh, to live in the Spirit, right? And right. so... I was going to um, ask you that. And P- yeah, right? I mean, yeah. it's, a, it, it's, it's a really big question. And mm-hmm. Paul, Paul gives us some pictures here, mm-hmm. but, um, you know, it's, it's not living perfectly. Okay. Uh, it, it's, it's, li- it's letting the Spirit drive how I live and the way I live. Mm. And, and uh, that can mean when I make mistakes, because we are human, this side of, yeah. uh, of eternity. And, um, but typically, how does the world respond to mistakes? How does the world respond to things yeah. that are misdeeds or what? And you know, with defensiveness, with mm. bear, you know, bury, bury it so nobody sees it. With, mm. but to you know, so as uh, uh, a light of Christ, if people want to see the Spirit, it's how we respond, even when we're not our best. And I think that's an important thing. For people to see too, you know, Christ, we don't claim to be perfect. We don't claim our church is perfect. We talked yeah. about nobody being perfect, yeah. um, mm-hmm. but we say we want to be a place where at least we're we're after healing, we're after wholeness, we're after forgiveness, right. we're after uh, restoration, mm-hmm. um, and uh, and that's that's the key to what the Spirit does. And so I just want to make sure people don't come away with you know right the binary choice that Paul gives us can make it hard to think that right. way. So and it's a discipleship is a is a process of mm-hmm. constantly trying to be formed more like God or seeing that we are formed in ways that are not like God, acknowledging that, and then trying to correct. And so it's not a decision you make one time and then you're perfect at discipleship or perfect at following God. But I'm curious, Scott, when you say to live in the Spirit, what does that mean for someone that maybe doesn't have an understanding of, okay, so I, I acknowledge there's a God, I acknowledge there's this guy named Jesus, I acknowledge that there's this Holy Spirit thing that's kind of a part of this. For my neighbor that um, I'm trying to explain this to, that I'm trying to live a Spirit-filled life, mm-hmm. what, what does that look like and how can we explain that in a way that maybe could make sense for someone that doesn't know what a Spirit-filled life looks like? Is it how we're acting? Is it um, how... Is it driving our thoughts? What does that look like? Yeah, I think it's an extension of of the gospel uh, mm. message. Um, mm-hmm. Really, that's just it's part of the outflow of 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 a life that it welcomes God into yeah. it. That's really what you're saying when you receive Christ, when you receive the gospel, is you're you're welcoming God now to right. be uh, the the person that mm. um, you know is Lord of your life. We talk about you know, Jesus being our Lord and our Savior. Yep. We probably, you know, a lot of people want Jesus to be their Savior, you know, like, mm-hmm. okay, sure, I don't, I, I want to live forever. I, I, hell does not sound like a good option for me. Um, and so I'm, I'm grateful. I want to have my sins forgiven. People love that part of it. Um, uh, but to, to really embrace the life that God has for you, it's my Lord, my Savior, and my Lord, and that means that I give over control of my life. And that's, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and Phil talked about this a little last week about the yeah. indwelling of the Spirit versus kind of the operation of the Spirit in your life. Mm-hmm. You know, when you receive Christ, when you invite Jesus into your heart, mm-hmm. which anybody can do, God is mm-hmm. always there. Um, but He, He's a gentleman too. He, you know, we, He won't force Himself on you. Mm-hmm. But if you welcome Him into your life, the Spirit it says will will come and live inside mm-hmm. our. And that's a powerful thought that God. Right as we said, is living in us um, and speaking to us um, in ways that, you know, we'll, we're, as we get into this chapter, we'll hear more about how that works. But yeah, um, but yeah to my neighbor, you know, who uh, is wondering about that, you know, the first step is just to say, hey, just are you at a place where you're willing to let God into your life? Yeah. Um, because that's what it means to have the Spirit yeah. in you. Yeah. yeah, I think there's, there's, a, there's a misnomer that hmm. when you are, when you are of faith or you are mm-hmm. in the spirit, that that means that what you ask God for will happen. Mm. Ah. 
and that there yeah. will be no difficulties. Yeah, Mm -hmm. And that when there are difficulties, mm -hmm. it means, or challenges, it means either God is not present mm -hmm. or he has forsaken you. Mm -hmm. um, and as I've, as I've gotten sort of deeper in my relationship with God, one of the things that is my signal is this idea of peace and joy. Mm -hmm. And so the idea that challenges will not happen is, mm -hmm. I think, is the lie of the devil, right? Mm -hmm. Because... The Bible talks about how we go through these situations to persevere, yeah. right? So that we can strengthen ourselves and, and strengthen our faith. Yeah. And so for me, the way I look at the spirit living in me is how am I feeling? Hmm. Am I in a state of mm -hmm. anxiety when things around me, it's almost like you're in the ocean and the ocean is really rough, but you're sitting in this boat. Are you calm? Hmm. And, and, and is your, where does your calm come from? Not because you're taking drugs, <laughs> but because, you know, like, are you high? Or, <laughs> are, or is the spirit in you telling you right. that, and, you know, this may not be a popular thing to say, but is, are you so confident that whatever happens in this boat, whether I drown or I survive, this is what God wants to happen. Yeah. Because I think yeah. that's where we are called to faith, mm. which is he, everything works together for our good, mm -hmm. but our good is not always what we want. Mm. And so I try to explain that to people that even when I'm going through the most challenging circumstances, God has, I do not believe God has forsaken me because I am always in spirit. Mm. And so I may be sick or I may be having challenges. God is taking me through this process either for me or for someone close to me, for it to be a testimony for someone, yeah. whatever it is, it is part of his plan. Yeah. And I think that's what we have to explain to our neighbors that, mm. you know, God is not, uh, what's that, you know, the machine where you put 50 cents in and you get a drink. Like a what are those? Machine? Yes. He's yeah. not, that's not what God yeah. is. You don't tell him what you want and he does it. Yeah. It's his plan. Mm. It's his will. Yeah. And when we pray and we're in the spirit, we actually want to be so deep in the spirit mm. that his will is our will, yeah. mm -hmm. not That's the good. other way around. Yeah. I'm hearing it's, 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 a, pers it's a posture and it's a perspective. Yeah. Yeah, and again, you know, if Jesus is Lord of our life, then He's the one in charge, not yeah. us. And that's the yeah. battle of, of our will and mm -hmm. and the Spirit slowly working on our hearts so that we hear and obey. Um, you know, and and those are two different things. We can hear what God's saying to us, but we can say, you know, not today, God. I'm, I know. I'm going to do it my way. Uh, I'm guilty of that. We'll see how this goes. Oh, all the all, are, all yeah. the time. Right? Never I mean, goes that, well, but uh -huh. that decision is in front of us every minute, every day, every year. You yeah. know, so we're we're always. And, and hopefully, and with the spirit inside us, our, our ears, our heart mm -hmm. is tuned a little more, mm -hmm. uh, and we get to learn it a little more, yeah. and we can have that peace, because I've learned how to listen to the voice of God in yeah. my life, right? And yeah. I know whose voice is whose, right. and it yeah. takes a while to, to sort that, um, yeah. but yeah, that's, that's Scott, powerful. What, what are some practices that have helped you be able to pay attention to those voices, knowing which one is the spirit, which one is, is not, and um, have that... How's that helped you tune your perspective? Yeah, I think all the, I would just say all the classic uh, spiritual practices that we, we know about, those basically are all designed for this purpose, right? Mm -hmm. To mm -hmm. enable us to hear the voice of God yep. uh, outside of the din and the lies and all mm -hmm. the things we hear. And so, you know, solitude and silence, right? I need to get quiet so that I can hear God's voice. We have that uh, great passage where, you know, um, uh, Elijah's at the, at the, uh, uh, you know, cave and mm -hmm. God's not in the fire or the earthquake. He's in the still, you know, so we need to be in a place where we can hear that voice. Cause uh, sometimes God shouts to us, but most of the time I think he's, he's speaking to us and we need to tune our ears. And so solitude, silence, fasting, all these practices mm -hmm. uh, enable us, give us space to, to hear. And once we hear, then we can hear that voice above the noise a little bit. Right. Yeah. Um, and uh, and it just takes time, I think, um, and and living in those practices mm -hmm. year after year, mm -hmm. um, and you know the Bible study. If I, when I when I read the Bible, part of that practice mm -hmm. is to get the words of Scripture in my mind and heart, so that I know because we know that God's voice is never going to contradict His word, right? So, yep. um, if if I hear something that contradicts His word, well. I can assume that that is not him. Yeah. So, you know, that's, that's all the disciplines kind of 
Yeah. Sorry, I wasn't pick, picking one, but... That's fine. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, anything specifically for you that has helped you over the years, over the years, be able to pay attention to God's voice a little more? I, I mean, I would agree with everything Scott said. Getting mm-hmm. quiet mm. is, is really important. Mm-hmm. It, you know, getting... I, I've created a really um, interesting practice of just getting deep in the Word. Okay. Um, what I does use that the Bible like? app as most as most people do. Yeah. You know, I'm you know I'm I've made reading the Word like just reading the morning paper now. Wow. Um, mm-hmm. So I think getting deep in the Word is important. Um, mm-hmm. My prayer life is very rich. Mm-hmm. So not just prayer in a quiet place, but just throughout my day yeah. talking to God. Yep. Um, one of the one of the areas of strength for me is 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 identifying other people I can pray with. Oh, interesting. So, yeah, when mm-hmm. I'm going through something and I'm I'm not feeling like I'm really hearing from God, mm-hmm. there are a couple of people I'll reach out to and say, look, can you pray with me on this? I'm mm-hmm. struggling with this mm-hmm. or I'm thinking about that. Um, and, you know, I feel like God does this thing with me. I call it breadcrumbs mm-hmm. where, you know, I'm kind of trying to figure something out and he'll just like leave little breadcrumbs mm-hmm. either through a passage mm-hmm. or something. You know, I'll come to church once. I remember telling Phil once, you know, I was praying about something and just before service, I had prayed, God, open my heart and my ears in the service so that I can hear your message. And literally Phil just answered something that I had been mm-hmm. thinking of. And I, in the <laughs> middle of service, yeah. I was like, what? Oh, is it? So I feel like you just have to keep your heart um, okay. just close to God, pray, mm. fast, ask, mm. you know, speak to people who are similarly yoked to, to you so okay. that you know that they are coming um, to help you mm-hmm. in a very spirit-led way as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I would say the final point about communicating God, with God is obedience, Mm. Um, I have found that when God speaks to me and I'm like, mm, that's not really what I want to hear. That's not <laughs> what I want to do. And I don't do it. It doesn't work well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I find when you ob- obey, mm. then he speaks more yeah. and he speaks louder and he speaks more clearly. Wow. So for me, okay. I'm trying to become a student of obedience. Yeah. It's fascinating. Thank you for sharing. Sorry. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. yeah. Happy to. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Scott, anything else that you would have included in this message that you wish you had more time and to expand on? Um, yeah, there's a lot in here, right? right. And so had to pull make it some in choices. So many threads are in here. Yeah. Um, I think uh, you know, there's one of the other ways to think about the the gift of being included in God's family and being heirs is just there's an incredible mm-hmm. amount of comfort in that, you know. And yeah. uh, and it, I didn't spend a lot of time talking about the power of being able to call God your daddy, you know, mm. the Abba. Uh, yeah. And uh, and just the, the incredible comfort that mm-hmm. comes from saying, uh, I am I am loved by God, I'm in, in the family, and uh, and I can call him, I'm the God of the universe, my daddy, which right. um, there's just a lot that you could unpack there, and uh, uh, I think a lot to say in terms of the comfort of it. Um, yeah. I, you know, tended to, in the sermon to talk more about uh, the vocational aspect of it, but uh, I think it's really powerful. I think another thing to keep in mind, you know, as you as we think about that parallel of of us being able to use that phrase, that Aramaic phrase "Abba" with, with, for God. You know, the time that Jesus used that was mm-hmm. was in the garden mm-hmm. <laughs> when he was obeying, but man, it was hard, right? And yeah. so, um, I think one of the things that's the other side of this, right, is that. I'm going to need, you know, if I'm really going to be a child, I'm going to live in my identity and my inheritance. There's going to be times that I'm going to need to call out to my daddy. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. so, you know, we get this privilege because we're going to walk down this road that's going to require it from us. And uh, so, yeah, I think there's more that could have been unpacked in that, but mm-hmm. uh, that's a really a powerful thought that I've been blessed with as I've studied this yeah. text. And as you said that, um, calling calling God by father puts us in a place of child mm. and it for as it kind of ties back to not trying to have to be perfect all the time in order to get love and acceptance children make mistakes all the time yeah right and for us to see ourselves as that but still want to continually try to follow in the teaching that our heavenly father is taking us in and teaching us about that removes for me at least i feel a little bit better about the pressure i feel to when i do get it wrong yeah. not to feel as bad I, you know, I, so I was raised by a single mom. Okay. My parents divorced when I was very young. And for many years, I, um, 
I carried a lot of shame hmm. of of being the product of a broken home. Okay. As it said, in my culture where I'm from, Nigeria, mm -hmm. it's, you know, it's, there's shame. Sure. And for many years, I carried that. And, you know, uh, many years ago, you know, just in developing as a Christian, you know, I grappled with that. Mm -hmm. And I remember the Holy Spirit telling me, you, you're not fatherless. You've never been fatherless. Mm -hmm. And it was it was like the warmest mm, and fuzziest wow. yeah. form of love I had ever felt mm -hmm. because, as I said, I carried the shame for so long that there was something lacking in me and mm. how I was raised that other people didn't have that was not normal. Mm. And, and, and my relationship with Christ has really changed that to you have a father, you've yeah. always had a father, you have a protector, you've always had a wow. protector. So I, I look at that Abba Father as just so much more intimate because he literally is the only father I've ever had. Mm. Wow. So it's, you know, for me, my relationship with God is is one of like sustenance. Yeah. It's, I, you know, yeah. I... I just, none of us would be breathing without him. But for me, it's almost, it's emotional, it's mental, it's mm -hmm. physical. It's, you know, all of that shame went away when mm -hmm. God told me, stop, why are you calling yourself fatherless? You have always had a father. I have always been there for you. Mm -hmm. You have never been without and you will never be without. Yeah. And so I feel that fatherhood in a very germane sense. Yeah. Hmm. Wow. Powerful. Yeah. 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 What a, that's a beautiful picture. And I think it's good to remember too, you know, people's relationships, right, with that word with, with father or dad is, is complicated. And family. And, uh, and yeah. family, yeah. right? That, yeah. These are all complicated mm -hmm. constructs. And so, um, you know, how God meets us in that, I think there's grace in that too. But to yeah. hear, um, yeah, you embrace that as, no, I have a father. That is a yeah. powerful and beautiful yeah, thank my daddy's for... a cool guy. Yeah. <laughs> He's awesome. A... Well, Scott, thanks so much for being here. Aisha, thank you for being here, too. Thanks it was having. great. Now you get to take home that giant iPad, Scott. It's like, yeah, it's I, like it's a personal size I get to take iPad it, don't I? Do we all take one home? You get one, you get yeah, one, you get one. Yeah, reach under your seat. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, thanks so much. And if um, for all you that are listening, thank you so much for sending in your questions and your thoughts as well. You can text our team at any time, 650-600-0402. Have a great week, everybody. Stay cool. And we'll see you soon. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye.